Holy sexuality. Have you ever put those two words together? Does it make sense to call sexuality holy? In the world we live in, there can be a lot of hurt, confusion, or misunderstanding surrounding the idea of sexuality and how we are to live it out. But God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the maker of humanity and the designer of our sexuality, has a lot to say on the topic. Join us as we dive into God's Word and discover His design for sexuality and, and how, how it, it can, can truly, truly be, be holy. Well, good evening, Trinity Church. How are we doing? Doing good? Okay, okay. Um, love the last song. What a great song as we approach this topic of sex and sexuality. Because um, I'm pretty sure I am looking at a people in need of God's grace. And when I look at the mirror, I see a man in need of God's grace, especially when we look at topics like sex and sexuality. So you guys ready? Think so? Hope, hopefully? Well, it is no secret that our, our culture is obsessed with sex. We live in such a, a sex-saturated world. We um, just... You turn on the television, you go to the movies, it's on Hulu, it's on, on Net, Hulu, that's a new service, by the way. Um, <laughs> but also on Hulu and, and Netflix, it is just everywhere on, on, on the screens, uh, it's, it's on our phones, it is everywhere. It's in Super Bowl halftime shows, it's, it is, you just can't get away from it. If you go on Amazon, there are over 180,000 different titles listed of books you can order related to sex, sexuality, and related topics. There is so much content, so many messages that are, that are just being bombarded to, to us, to the world we live in, and no wonder that people are confused. People are questioning, like, what is this? What do I do with this? There's, we're just living in this heavy fog of sex saturation, and none of it seems to make a whole lot of sense. None of it seems to, to really work. So, so what does that leave us as Christ followers? Well, even as Christ followers, we are not immune from being touched by this fog, by this distortion, by this confusion. So this, 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 not this morning, this evening, I should say, we want to look at God's Word. We want to look at God's Word and see its design for sex and sexuality, and, uh, and that's, well, that's going to be the bulk of our time together. Now, each week we want to highlight different resources, so I want to do that now for just a minute. This is a really helpful book. It's called The Talk. And the, the picture that's on the screen is actually not the right one, but, um, well, it's not on the screen yet. So it looks like this. It's by Luke, Luke Gilkerson, and it's actually in your uh, parent prompts if you're interested in looking it up. Uh, if you have kids at home, it is our job to shape a biblical sexuality for our kids. And that can be maybe a pretty intimidating task. But if we don't do anything, we're saying, culture, you guys take care of it for us. Because that's going to work out real well, right? So, and, and this is not just about having the talk, but the beginning of an ongoing dialogue. This is talks, plural. There's seven here, but even seven would be grossly inadequate when you, can, when you compare it to all the content that even our children are consuming, and they're watching, and they're taking it in. But this is a really helpful conversation guide. You can literally use this as a script, or just simply as a guide, but really, really helpful. The other book is The Mingling of Souls. It's by Matt Chandler. Really enjoy him. Um, Listen, read his book the last week or two. Really like it. Uh, particularly, actually, if you find yourself more in like the dating stage, single. Um, man, the, there's three chapters about attraction, dating, and courtship that are just crazy good. I, I have not encountered uh, something this articulate with, uh, just filled with wisdom, uh, just spelled out really, really, really well. And then the book goes on to, you know, marriage stuff and, 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 and you know, fighting fair communication and uh, even just how, how do you uh, make, how do you keep the flame alive as we, you know, get older, you're 20 years in, you're 30 years in, you're 40 years in. But 
the first three chapters were just absolutely incredible. So if that fits your demographic, I would highly encourage you to pick that up. Now, sex can be a difficult topic to talk about. It can be, uh, for some of us, awkward. But for some others of us, it can be actually a really painful topic. It's deeply personal. Uh, it, can be, it can be very emotional. Because th there's people here, uh, undoubtedly, who are wounded. There's scars. And maybe time haven't, hasn't even passed yet. They're not even scars yet. They're literally open wounds related to sex and sexuality. Some of you may be in, in, in a time of even just disappointment in your marriage. It feels like you're, you're two people living in the same house, and that is about it, and you know that God has more for you. Maybe there's just a lot of tension. Maybe there's distrust. So it's, it can be a really challenging place to come from. So today, as we look at God's word, we want to look at God's word, and, 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 and I, want to, I want to teach God's words with accuracy and clarity. We want to understand, God, what are you saying about this stuff? Because there's so much fog out there. God, what, what, what does your word communicate for us? Because it does. He's got a lot to say. But also, how do we communicate that, that with, with grace? How do we communicate that through a gospel lens? That through the lens of the cross, through the lens of a loving Savior, a gracious Savior, a forgiving Savior, a Savior with unconditional love, but it's also all about truth. So here's where we're going this evening in our now what. It says, enjoy, protect, and cultivate God's good gift of sex to grow in oneness as husband and wife. That's where we're going. And uh, the best place to start, I think, is in the beginning. So let's start in Genesis chapter 1. We looked at Genesis chapter 1 last week, and Genesis chapter 1 kind of represents this 30,000-foot um, level, this 30,000-foot uh, view of creation. It is kind of broad strokes. And then Genesis chapter 2, that is the boots on the ground. That, that is a close-up view of God's creation. It's the same you know, account. He's doing the same creating. But this is a close-up view, particularly as it relates to him creating man and woman. And then bringing them together in oneness in a covenant relationship we call marriage. So let's start in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. It says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone, and I will make a helper suitable for him. Here's the deal. As image bearers of God, we, we, are, we are image bearers of God. We, we bear his image. We reflect his image in our relationality. God is a relational being, and, and so are we. He's created us as such. He, when he created Adam, he created him to be relational. And having, re having a relationship, having conversations with the animals apparently didn't work out so well. So he said, I got to do something about this. I'm going to create a woman. So he created Eve. And then Adam is so excited. In verse 23, he says, the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He's, he's jumping up and down. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is God's blueprint of God's design. This is his design. This is his masterpiece. And what do we discover? That as image bears, we, we, we reflect God in, in our maleness and femaleness. We reflect God when we come together in oneness. Genesis chapter 1, we, we, we see that God says, you know, be fruitful and multiply. He designed this, this sexual relationship for procreation, but he has so much more than that in store for us. And God brings this man and this woman together in this covenant relationship. And he spells it out as follows. Number one, there's leaving involved. Leaving. And that's important. It says, that is why a man leaves his father and mother. A new family is formed when a marriage is started. A new family is started. New loyalties are formed. Our first loyalties are now to our spouse. 
and, and our, our families that we come from take a back seat. And it's no secret that that can even be a challenge in our, in our marriage relationships, how to relate to our in-laws and parents and all that stuff. Because it's not an easy thing, the leaving thing. The next step is this, and he is united to his wife. There's uniting taking place. This is really strong language. This is the language of like super glue. Like once you you get stuck together, not meant negatively, once you you stick, you can't unstick it, which is why divorce is so incredibly destructive. This this, this stickiness that that we we see here is, is the language of covenant not contract. A contract is the exchange of goods and services. And if the goods and services stop flowing, it's time to renegotiate or to cancel your contract. This covenant language speaks of permanence. This covenant language speaks of unconditional love, the same love that, that God displayed through the Son, this unconditional love of sacrifice. We didn't deserve that. This language of stickiness is faithfulness to a vow, faithfulness to a promise, faithfulness to a calling to be a husband, faithfulness to a calling to be a wife. And then it says, based, you know, after all this background, he says, and they become one flesh. And oneness, oneness is created. And this, this, this oneness relationship, this one flesh relationship is incredible. It's an incredible union. And it's not just a physical union, though it is physical. It is a sexual union. It is an emotional union. Um, there, there is a um, spiritual union. This is a deep, deep sense of oneness that is far, far beyond just a physical act, a physical coming together. Sex here is not self-gratifying. It is not a form of self-expression. Sex here is self-giving to one another. Tim Keller, he's a theologian and pastor and scholar. Um, He put it something like this. I say something like this because I couldn't find the quote again. So, uh, sex is self-giving of one's entire person so deeply, so holy, so holy, that it results in personal transformation and completion. And I love that. That is just a powerful definition. And I'll I'll say it again, and I think it's mostly accurate. Um, And I read, I just use my own words a little bit. But sex is self-giving of one's entire person so deeply and so holy and so holy that it results in personal transformation and completion. This speaks of, of sexual equality, mutuality, reciprocity, of joy and pleasure. This is an amazing, powerful gift. And this gift of oneness is only safe in marriage. This is such a powerful gift that there's no other uh, relationship that can sustain and support the deep oneness of this emotional, spiritual, physical, sexual union that takes place. A dating relationship isn't intended, isn't designed to support that kind of weight. It's almost like if you're building a skyscraper, you're going to build it up like 80 stories tall. You have to create an incredible foundation. You have to go down you know, super far. I'm not a skyscraper builder, but I do know this. You got to go way down into bedrock and, and get it anchored and get it solidified so that it can support the incredible weight of an 80 story building. Similarly, when when God designed and has given this gift of sex and oneness, it can only be uh, kept safe and cultivated, and and we can grow in this only when the covenantal relationship is in place to help support it. That's why it is so destructive and painful when we engage in, when, when we disengage from God's design, when we venture out on our own and we get burned, we get hurt, and we hurt other people in the process. So then the question becomes, how do we live out a Genesis 2 design in a Genesis 3 world? 
If you're not familiar with, 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 the, with the biblical storyline, Genesis 3 marks the, the entrance of sin into the world. And the world would never be the same again. And sin touches everything from that point on. It touches it. It doesn't destroy everything, but it certainly touches everything. Everything it touches is impacted by it. True. Um, it touches our relationships. Genesis 3 touches sex. Genesis 3, the sin, touches marriages. It, 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 it touches gender. The relationships and, and how we do relationships has been an, impacted by, by, by sin and, and how it, it, it's, it's represented in our selfishness, in pride. We have cases of abuse because of Genesis 3. Deep brokenness, confusion, twisting of God's design. And in sec instead of sex enjoyed and in, 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 in the context of a covenant relationship, according to God's grand design, we chase false intimacy in things like pornography. We chase a, a misplaced intimacy when we seek sex outside of marriage. So how do we live this out? This Genesis 2, this amazing design in a Genesis 3 world. Well, God has not left us alone. He's given us wisdom, words of wisdom. And so we have a whole genre of the Bible. It's, it's wisdom literature. Uh, and we're going to look at the book of uh, Proverbs to start out. And the book of Proverbs has much to say about sexuality. And there's a lot of words of, of caution that, that we find there. Um, Genesis, uh, Proverbs chapter 5 has, has some really powerful instruction that I want to look at even tonight. In verse 18 it says this, May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? And we find here very much that, that sex is designed for pleasure, to be enjoyed. He says, delight yourself in the wife of your youth. Delight yourself in your husband. He, he's, he's been given to you to enjoy, to delight. But then we also see that sex is exclusive. So why, my son, would, would you venture out? There, there, there's a radical exclusivity here that God is calling us to, to protect that relationship, to protect that oneness. Now, in the book of Song of Solomon, we don't spend a lot of time in the, in the Song of Solomon for some reason, but we are tonight. And um, it, is, it is a giant love poem. It takes eight chapters. It traces um, the story of a couple from attraction to like, dating, courtship, marriage, some fighting, and then they grow old together, and, and they're able to keep this oneness alive, and they keep growing in their relationship. Um, and it's a really... Uh, amazing story, difficult to understand because it's very poetic. Um, it, is, it is very direct and, and, and um, erotic, but never crude in its description of God's design for sex. And um, chapter four is, is the wedding night. I mean, the fireworks are going off. And it, it, is, it is the wedding night. It, it presents this ideal picture of sex in this poetic way. And here's the deal, like, it's, it's almost like fairy tale-ish, but our lives are not really lived in, in, the po po in, the, in the poetry realm. It's like, we've got jobs, and we've got um, a husband-wife relationship, and we don't always, like, see to eye, eye to eye on things, on, like, big issues or something. Or, man, we just got, we're exhausted because of uh, work and, and careers, and, and um, so when we look at this ideal picture of um, Song of Solomon, the last thing I wanted to do is be a discouragement to you, like, oh, I guess that's not us. Um, dang it. <laughs> Rather, I want it to be a vision, a vision to chase after, realizing that God has good gifts for you and your spouse. So let's dive in, shall we? Let's do it. Chapter 4, verse 1. I think you'll like this. How beautiful you are, my darling. 
Oh, how beautiful. So, sounds like a Hallmark card. We're, we're doing well here. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats. He lost me. Uh, this took a turn. Descending from the hills of Gilead. Um, less Hallmarkish, Gentlemen, I would not recommend any direct quotes. You know, good, quoting these to, to, your, to your, uh, the love of your life. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn. Mm -hmm. Coming up from the washing, each has its twin, and not one of them is alone. You know what he's saying, right? Honey, you've got all your teeth, and I'm, I'm loving it. I mean, come on, smile, baby, smile. Let me see those teeth. And he is super stoked on the teeth. Verse, verse, uh, verse 3, your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth, it is lovely. And your temples behind your veil are like the halves of pomegranates. Of course they are. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with courses of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Wow. It's pretty good stuff, right? I mean, you guys get this. This is good. Uh, remember, no direct quotations. Um, here's the deal. Sex is incredibly romantic. You're like... That's what you got from the flock of goats. Um, yes, here's the deal, because um, we are listening, we're reading these words with um, our lenses in the year you know, 2020. Modern, modern ears, mo modern lenses, instead of the ancient Near Eastern lenses from thousands of years ago. This is absolute romantic poetry. Here's the deal, about a few chapters earlier, this, um, this bride, they were still dating at that point, revealed some insecurities. She disclosed some insecurities about her physical appearance. And what does he do here? He builds her up. He affirms her beauty. He speaks into those places where she's, she's shy and she, she's maybe a little, there's some brokenness there. And he, and he speaks words of life there, words of grace, and he builds her up. So praise your wives. Wives, praise your husbands. If you like what you see, let them know. It's good. That's what this guy did. Praise her character, her competencies. And don't start at like 9.30 at night. You're like, I've got plans. <laughs> Better start praising her. It's not how it works. You've heard, of, you've heard this, I'm sure, that women are like crockpots and men are like microwaves. Works a little different. So start early. Let it be part of your vocabulary to build up, to affirm. Let's go on. Verse 5, your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. Here we have a, a glimpse of, of passion and of tenderness. Passion and tenderness. Sex is passionate and sex is tender. Well, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, was that a little, like, a little shout out? A shout out to the fawns. Let me talk about the fawns. I'm not a hunter, but if you, ha if you see some, uh, some deer, you know, grazing among the lilies, you probably don't want to, like, if you, if you want to go near the fawns, you don't want to just go in for a sprint and tackle a fawn. It's not going to, it's not going to work well. So this picture that, that Solomon paints is, is a picture of tenderness, of care and concern. And I love that. So sex, it, but then he, he's very passionate, but it's tender, it's gentle. Let's look at verse 9. You have stolen my heart, my sister, my bride. You have stolen my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. Here's a question. Gentlemen, has she stolen your heart? Wives, has he stolen your heart? Have other things captured your heart? Even good things. Have other people captured your heart? 
and taken her place? Has pornography stolen your heart away from your wife? And this is not intended to shame or bring on guilt, but to open the door to freedom. Because if that's you, we want to be of help. We want to help you walk in victory and in sexual integrity, recapturing your heart, directing it to the, all your sexual energies to the right place. And we have some amazing men that will walk shoulder to shoulder with you. Maybe has our careers captured our hearts? And I say this as, as the family pastor, have our children captured our hearts over that of our spouse? It happens. Good things to think about and evaluate. He goes on, verse 10, how delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much more pleasing is your love than wine and the fragrance of your perfume more than any spice. Do you sense the passion? Your lips drop sweetness as the honeycomb, my bride. Milk and honey are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments are like the fragrance of Lebanon. And apparently Lebanon smells pretty good. I'm not sure what it smells like. But here's the point in verse 11, how we speak to our spouse's matters. He describes the way that she speaks to him as sweet, as affirming. A harsh word, a critical word spoken earlier in the day will absolutely make its way back into the bedroom later. Keep short accounts. Yes, we, we, we live, you know, as, as, as husbands and wives and and. There, there's bound to be things that are like, oh, I probably shouldn't have said that. Then make it right. Honey, I shouldn't have said that. That came across way different in my head. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm so sorry. Make it right. Because there's oneness at stake. Here's how she responds in verse 16. Awake, north wind, and come, south wind, blow on my garden that its fragrance may spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. And he responds again, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh with, with my spice. And I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Here's some principles that, that jump to the surface, that, that sex is reciprocal. We see mutuality. It is not self-gratifying. It is self-giving. It is, it, is, it is fulfilling. He's, he's after on, a chap, on verse one, he's just kind of thinking back like, that was awesome. That was great. And she's saying the same thing. Mutually fulfilling reciprocal, self-giving, serving each other. Now let's jump into the New Testament for just a few minutes. Hebrews 13.4. Hebrews 13.4 highlights another principle. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. What I want to highlight here is this, that sex is holy. Sex is incredibly holy. It is God's gift for us. It is God's gift that he has set apart. He has consecrated it to be enjoyed by us, his children, where he brings a, a husband and a wife, two individuals, and makes them one. It is a miracle what he, ha what, what he does, what he does with that. And it is holy. It is holy. It is not dirty. God's not a prude. God celebrates this union. This holiness is to be protected, to be guarded, to be stewarded. Because oneness is at stake. 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7 speaks to this topic as well. Sometimes you might think, um, 
wouldn't be so easy. It would be so much easier if we lived in Bible times, you know, with our sandals and robes and stuff. Um, because clearly they wouldn't have like all this garbage that we have to deal with. And I, th- I, th- I think we might be wrong. Because here in 1 Corinthians, in, in the city of Corinth, they're, 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 uh, the main line, like sexual practices looked a little bit like this. If you wanted to have sex for the purpose of procreation, well, you, you got to do that with your wife to like build your family. If it's sex for pleasure, then yeah, probably not your wife, actually. You probably do that with someone else within your household, or you go out to maybe a temple prostitute, make it a worship experience, or just, just, just look around and see, see who's out. That's wild. So then imagine this. Now these people in Corinth, they, um, they, they turn their lives to Jesus. And I'm like, pretty sure we shouldn't be doing that. And, um, but what do we do? What does it look like to, be, to put into practice a biblical sexual ethic that glorifies God? So then they thought, you know what? Maybe it's just better if, if we just don't. Maybe we just, we just shouldn't have sex We should just not. And Paul says, not such a good idea. So here's what he writes. Now for the matters you wrote about. So they wrote a letter asking asking him this question. And he quotes it here. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Well, he says, actually, here's the deal. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. So he highlights here, again, that sex is exclusive. It is exclusive. And he he calls them to just fidelity in this relationship to protect the oneness, the mingling of souls. Verse 3 and 4, The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. This is revolutionary. I mean, their, 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 their categories just got scrambled. Because ladies had no rights, much less, like, sexual rights. I don't think so. But Paul says, no, no, that is not God's design. And he, he elevates women and makes them equal to the men. And he says to, to, the, um, to the wife, your, your, your body and all your, that, that belongs to your husband. But... Your husband and all that he is, his body, it belongs to you. It is is selfless. Sex is selfless. It is a gift. Sex is a gift. It, It is the giving of oneself to another. It is this deep giving, selfless experience that he has in view. And this is completely revolutionary. This is not about just finding sexual release, but building sexual union. This is about investing in oneness. The sexual relationship, it is given. It is never demanded. It, it, is, it is not coerced. It is never insisted upon. He goes on. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And here we see that sex protects the marriage. It protects the marriage, and that's important to, to Paul. So here depriving, what he's talking about, about starving the marriage of, of the sexual relationship, the sexual coming together. He says, don't starve the marriage of this good gift that I have given you, except perhaps for a time to devote to prayer. Now, starving the marriage is very different from um, you maybe approaching your wife and she says, I'm sorry, I'm like, like, not tonight, I am exhausted. 
They're like, but honey, it says, like, do not deprive garbage. <laughs> garbage. That is not what these verses mean. Unfortunately, they've been twisted and abused in that very sense. Honey, not tonight means you get to live, as 1 Peter 3 says, to live with your wife in an understanding way. If, if, if she says, honey, not tonight, you get to practice Ephesians 5, where, where men, where husbands are called to, to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her with sacrificial love. That is your opportunity to, to actually push into oneness from a very different angle, through a serving angle, but it's powerful. And you say, honey, get some sleep. We'll take a rain check. So now what? Where, where, where does that leave us? I think it leaves us here. Enjoy, protect, and cultivate God's good gift of sex to grow in oneness as husband and wife. It's an amazing gift. Can I get an amen? Yeah. That's pretty good. But here's the deal. This is not a talk about trying harder. I just have to be a better husband. I just have to be a, like a better wife, then it'll be better. Here's, we've all been tainted by Genesis 3. The reason why I, I'm, I'm not um, as, as, as wonderful as a husband as I, as I could be, as, as God is calling me to be, it's because I still have selfishness in me. I still have pride in me. I still have a whole list of things where God is not done with me yet. And I have to look at, and, and read uh, the Song of Solomon 4 and, and look at Hebrews and, and look at Genesis and say, God, I need a work, a continual work of transformation in my heart. This is not a sermon about you really ought to bring your wife more flowers. Though that's good too. She, she'll like that. But she's more interested in, in your heart changing to become more like Jesus so that you can love her better, love her more sacrificially, and serve her more. We need the gospel. We need the power of Jesus working in us as husbands and wives. And as he is transforming us, we are building oneness. So enjoy God's good gift. Invest. Prioritize. But then also, for those of you that are, that are struggling... I want to encourage you to pursue healing, to pursue wholeness in the areas where you feel brokenness, where you feel pain, where you feel shame and guilt. Shame and guilt is not by God's design. So how do we live in the freedom of the gospel? How do we embrace the scandal of grace that we sang about earlier? For most of us, that, that doesn't happen overnight. It's not a magic pill. It is a journey that, 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 we, that we start with other people around us, trusted people, experienced people who have probably walked in your shoes that want to come alongside you. Maybe it's healing from abuse. Maybe it's healing from a, a sexual past that, 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 that still haunts you. And, and you know that, that that was so long ago, and, and you've met Jesus, but, but how do you live in light of the fact that, um, you know, Romans 8, when there's no now condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, you know the words, but it's difficult to live out. But that's God's will for you, to embrace that freedom, to embrace that reconciliation, and restoration, transformation of the heart to wholeness. Contact one of our pastors. Call me this week. Come talk to me after the service. We have some amazing ladies that, 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 that want to help women 
be, be just godly women in, in just all areas of their lives. We have an amazing group of men we'd love to connect you with. If, 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 even the, if pornography is a concern, masturbation, we want to help you. It is okay to be not okay. We've all been touched by the Genesis 3 brokenness, and it has touched our sexuality. But Jesus has a vision to make us whole by his power, by his spirit, by his grace. We'd love to pray for you as well here tonight, and that can happen after the service. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for who you are. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace, your lavish grace. Father, your grace was costly. It was costly. But you will not withhold it from us, Lord. It, it, we, we ask you to just... Just pour your grace all over us. And Lord, I pray that your grace would hit, hit some, some of these spots that are pretty tender right now. They're pretty vulnerable, pretty exposed. And, and Father, we, we just pray for healing. We pray for reconciliation. Lord, we pray for, for marriages to thrive. Lord, to, for marriages to come from brokenness to wholeness. And Lord, we pray that that journey might even start tonight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.